I start with a quick review this morning. I, I'm preaching a series. It's just a, a short three-week series, but because of that, I'm doing it Sunday morning and Sunday nights on studying the Bible, and I think it's so important that we read our Bibles daily. Uh, uh, a lot of times we get this far into the year. We're about three weeks into the year, and people have missed some days, or, or maybe you just kind of stopped altogether. Uh, but my encouragement to you is, is start again. I, I'm, I'm sure I've said this before, but I heard a, a preacher one time say, if you forget to brush your teeth, uh, you, don't, you don't give up brushing your teeth. You just say, I'm going to start again. You know? And so if we, if we forget to read the Bible, don't, don't give it up and don't say, well, I missed a day. I'm just going to quit trying. No, if you missed a day, start the next day. Say, I'm going to get back on track. Uh, nothing, nothing will help your Christian life like reading the Bible every day. And so uh, this is really what this study is. It's just a very basic study. We could obviously get uh, much deeper, uh, but on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night series, what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to do is just encourage us to read the Bible and that you can read the Bible and that you can study the Bible. And we can all understand the Bible from the youngest person in here uh, to the oldest person in here. Uh, all of us can understand the Bible. And God wants you to understand the Bible. And so I just encourage you to, to read your Bible every day. If it's a teenager, maybe even a junior higher in here, uh, start reading your Bible every day. Uh, if it's uh, uh, any age group in between, all the way up to the oldest. Uh, all of us ought to have the daily habit of reading our Bible. And so uh, some quick review of some things that we went over last week. We talked about some spiritual qualifications for understanding the Bible uh, and today we're going to look at some general helps. Now those spiritual qualifications, if you're going to understand the Bible, uh, begins with salvation. Uh, you need to be saved. It's a spiritual book. And so if you don't know the Lord, uh, you're, you're not going to really understand the truths of God's Word. And so it's a spiritual book. Uh, we talked about surrender. Uh, God reveals more to those who will obey Him. That's a biblical principle all throughout the Bible. And so you have a a, a a predisposition that I'm going to obey, uh, that whatever I hear, whatever I read, I'm going to do it. If God reveals something to me, I'm going to obey him. And when you have that attitude, here's what you'll find. God will reveal more things to you, and he'll, more, he'll make more things understandable to you. Uh, we talked about seriousness, because it is a holy book, and it's a reverent book. We've, we've got to come with a serious attitude. Uh, you've got to be serious about studying the Bible. Uh, in, in the day in which we live where everything's so busy and all the different forms of media, we've got to put some distractions aside to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my undivided attention to God's Word, that I can understand this. And then supplication or pray. Ask the Holy Spirit. Ask Him to help you. Ask Him to help you to understand it. And then studiousness, just that it's, uh, there's a, a systematic approach that you can take. There's rules that you can learn, and, and we're going to look at some of those uh, again this week. Uh, the two basic rules that we looked at last night, and very, or last Sunday night, very, very basic. But number one, the Bible's a book, but as a book, it has a message that the author was trying to communicate. And so just like we'd pick up any book and try to get the meaning of that book and, and what it was that the author was trying to communicate, uh, we can pick up the Bible and read it that way. And then the Bible was a book written by humans for humans. Now, God's the author. We know that. But as the author, God used uh, humans to pen it. And he, he kept their personality and he kept uh, their background. And, and God gave them the words to write to us. But he, he used humans to write a book for humans so that we can understand it. Why? Because God wants his book to be understood. God wants his book to be, uh, uh, to be read. And then I just want to focus again uh, on two specific words in our text there, study and workman. Uh, one of the definitions for study is, to, is diligent to make every effort. And that's the way that we ought to approach God's word, uh, that we ought to be diligent, that we ought to make every effort. Say, I want, to, I want to make every effort to get something out of this book. And then the word worker in that text may be my favorite word in that text, uh, but it also is probably the most convicting word in that text because it kind of calls out being lazy. And many times we had a quote last week that I gave in the Sunday morning sermon. It's not that we don't read because we don't understand or because we don't have time. We just have to realize that we don't read it because we're lazy. And so a workman means it's going to take work. It's going to take effort, but it is going to be worth it. And so uh, a workman, just like an agricultural worker, uh, some of you may be 
uh, detasseled corn when you were young or you put up hay when you were young. Uh, some, of those, some of those tasks without all the machinery and things that they have today. You said, well, that was, that was hard work. Hottest months of the year here in Indiana and out there sweating like crazy. And uh, it just, you say that it's hard work. Well, that's, that's the same word. It, it's an agricultural, a laborer, uh, a workman. That's the way we ought to approach the Bible. Say, I'm going to put time into this. I'm going to put work into this. Uh, and so that can be a convicting word, can it? Because we have to be honest with ourselves and say, the reason I've not got a lot out of the Bible, I've not put a lot into the Bible. I've not put a, a lot of myself into it to get something out of it. The Bible has a theme. It has a, a main message. In fact, uh, each book has a theme. Many of the chapters have a specific theme. All of those things will help us to understand it when we realize there's an overall theme of the Bible. Uh, there are uh, books that have themes to them. There are chapters that have themes to them. And when we look for those things, it will help us to understand it as a whole. And so let's look specifically here three ways that God has made his main message to us clear. And this morning, I'm just going to look at one of them, but it's going to have three points, and then we'll look at the other two tonight. And so number one, uh, in this uh, first uh, specific rule, or this first specific help that God uses clear language, is that God is revealing, not concealing. God is revealing, not concealing. So if you're filling out the blanks there, uh, they're up there on the screen as well. So uh, God uses clear language. That will help you to understand the Bible, that God uses uh, language that can be understood. He's, he's revealing his word to us. He's not given us this book with a concealed meaning that is hard and difficult for us. No, he's given us a book that reveals his message to us, that if we'll take time to read it, it will become apparent to us uh, that God has things that he wants us to know. Uh, there, there are things, it, it, it is fascinating to me that no matter what question it is, God has the answer. Uh, the, this morning, the, the Sunday school lesson in the class that I set in uh, was on ruptured relationships. Uh, and, and that's something that we still deal with in the year 2024. Uh, you have relationships that are broken. Uh, you have relationships that are strained. And it is, isn't it interesting that God had a story in the Bible that we can go back to where there was a strained relationship, and not only was there a story about it, but there's a response, and, and there's a way to, to have victory over that relationship, uh, to, to actually be able to restore that relationship. And it was the story of David and Saul, and David never restored the relationship with Saul. He was never able to do that, uh, but David reached out to the grandson. He was able to uh, restore uh, fellowship. He was able to live peaceably with all men, Paul talks about in the book of Romans. And, and it's just fascinating. No matter what, what, what subject it is or what question it is, God has dealt with things in his word. Uh, so that we can have answers and we can have helps. He's revealing things to us. The Bible is God's revelation to man. Think about that. That everything God wanted us to know, he said, I've revealed to you in my book. And that's the written word. And then God gave us a second. He gave us his son, Jesus Christ. He was everything revealed in the living word. And God wants us to know things about him. God says, I've revealed it to you. He wants his word to be understood. It's, it's not one of those, it's a, it's a well, I, I hope one day I can understand it. I remember being in high school, and uh, I signed up for chemistry class, and I went to chemistry class, and it was one of those where I didn't really like the teacher, and it just didn't seem like uh, his personality and my personality, and we were I, I was really having a hard time understanding chemistry, and I, I was trying to get good grades, but I was having a hard time getting good grades in that class, and, and, and my hope was, at some point this year, I'll understand this. If I keep being diligent, I keep applying myself, and eventually I did. I eventually understood it, and, but, but that's not the way with the Bible. You know, it's not, it's not, well, I hope one day I can understand it. No, you can understand it. God wants you to understand it. God's used, it, God's used clear language <coughs> Excuse me, that you might be able to understand it. Uh, God has the capacity of language. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, word simply means a word, something said, what someone has said. Uh, God has the capacity of language. God, uh, the creator of the universe, can speak to you and me, and he's chosen to speak to you and me. 
uh, Jesus is the Word. John 1, verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God has revealed His Word to man. And we ought to just kind of stand in awe of that, that God revealed His Word to man. And, and that we could just, that's one of those that you could just kind of set and meditate on a little bit and think about a little bit, that God wants us to know things about him. And then think about the other side of that, that then we would neglect this book, that we would just kind of throw it up in the back of the window or throw it up on the dresser and not pick it up again until Sunday. Think about that. God has revealed his word to us. What does that tell us? I ought to be in it every day. You ought to be in it every day. What can I get out of this? What can I get from God? Because he's trying to reveal himself to me. And we ought to have a desire uh, to be in his word. Uh, Letter B there, the Bible is conveyed to us through language. The Bible is conveyed to us through language. Specifically, the written word. That God had his word to be written. Uh, It was uh, 40 different human authors Uh, Then over time, it's been, uh, not only was it inspired, and those men wrote it, but it's been preserved, that it was copied, it was handed down, and so God has uh, given us this revelation through the written word. It's to be approached as a piece of literature to be understood, and just like literature uses different literary elements, uh, sometimes simile and metaphor and hyperbole and all the different things you can learn about literature, uh, the Bible uses that kind of language, language, figurative language. James or Jeremiah 23 and verse 29 is not my word like as a fire. And the word like there uh, tells us not that his word is fire, but it's like fire. It helps us to see a picture that helps us to understand. We, we, we know some things about fire, and so the things that we know about fire we can compare to his word. And, and what fire does is what his word does, saith the Lord. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Uh, uh, I remember I went with uh, Jeremiah and some other people. We went four willing down in southern Indiana. And there in the, uh, the creek or the river that we were kind of riding through or passing across, there's just tons and tons of geodes. And we stopped and we had a hammer and we, we hit them. Of course, we were trying to hit them just enough to get them to split. Uh, and those things are super cool on the inside, and you can look at them. And uh, the kids that were riding with us, they thought that was awesome to hit them with a rock and get them to break open and look inside of those. Uh, and again, so we can, we can relate to a hammer and what a hammer does, and that's how God works on us. God takes his hammer of his word, and he hits away, and, he, and he, he breaks. Sometimes a person that we've been praying for, a person that we wanted to be saved, and in our own heart we thought, I don't know if they'll ever receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. I don't know if, if God could ever get through to them. But you know what God was doing? His, his word was hammering away. And sometimes, sometimes we don't always see what's happening. We don't always know how God's working. We, we give a gospel tract to someone, we invite him to church, and we think, well, that, that didn't do anything. No, there's power in the word of God. God says, my word shall not return void. Sometimes at work, a conversation came up, and, and you spoke up boldly for the Lord, and, and you didn't preach a whole sermon, but you just said something from the word of God, maybe that it helped you, and you thought maybe this would help them, and you don't always see that it helped. But God, God's word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And, and that verse helps us to understand that God uses language that we can relate to to help us better understand his word. Uh, how about Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, that's an amazing verse. Being a pastor and uh, preaching messages and teaching Sunday school lessons, uh, sometimes we give a lesson, but the, the Holy Spirit of God, he takes the word of God and takes it right to a person's heart. Things that a teacher would never know is going on in a person's private, personal life. Things that a pastor or an evangelist would, would never know that's going on, but God knows And God has a way of taking his word and piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. God's word. God uses his word to speak to our hearts right where we're at. 
I, I don't know exactly how many people I didn't count this morning, just kind of looking at things. I'd say maybe there's 160 people in here this morning, and out of 160 people, uh, we, we are all different. We all have different things going on. Even husbands and wives, you're not just alike. Even if you've been married 40, 50 years, you're not just alike. There's different things going on in your life, different things that you're struggling with. But God knows each person. God knows exactly what you need to hear, and he, he takes his word, and it gets into our heart. And that helps us to understand the Bible. See, God uses such clear language that, we would, help, that would help us to understand the, the things that he's trying to do in our life and the purposes that he's trying to accomplish. <coughs> Excuse me. Scripture is the, the written form of God's special revelation for his people. Uh, Mark chapter 12. Let's, let's turn over to that one. I want you to see that one. Mark 12 and verse 36 and 37. I'm going to let you get just a minute to get there. And here, here Jesus is teaching, and he's, he's referring to an Old Testament passage in the book of Psalms and David. <coughs> but he's, he's using that author, and he's using the Holy Spirit synonymously so so notice what he says here mark 12 and verse 36 for david himself said by the holy ghost the lord said to my lord set thou on my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool david therefore himself calleth him lord and whence is he then his son and the common people heard him gladly for david himself said by the holy ghost and and there jesus is telling us that 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 the bible is God's word to us. That it was David that wrote it down. It was David that was speaking, but it was from the Holy Spirit. It was from the Holy Ghost. And so that helps us understand what the Bible is. That the Bible is God's word to man, but he used man to write it for us. And so it, God is revealing, not concealing. Secondly, we're, we're to approach with the attitude of understanding. Approach with the attitude of understanding. Uh, um, when we open up the Bible, <clears throat> that we read this as this is a book I can understand. This is a book I can know. This, this is a book that I can learn. I'm, I'm going to approach it with understanding. Uh, now, it may not make sense. If I said how many of you have ever read the Bible or read a chapter or read a passage and it didn't make sense, I think probably almost everybody that's read the Bible would have to say there's been a time like that. Maybe there's been several times like that. There's several passages that I've read in the Bible that I'd say it doesn't exactly make sense, but it can make sense. It can make sense. Sometimes we, 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 we read something that doesn't seem to make sense, but it can make sense. Uh, why? Because it uses regular language. The Bible uses regular language. It's not some made up or mystical language. Remember being in elementary or junior high, they talked about pig Latin people spoke in pig latin or maybe you and your friends you made up some kind of hidden language this code language that your mom you could be planning to do something that you shouldn't have been doing and you could be sitting in the back seat talking about it to your friend and mom and dad don't un they don't know what we're talking because we're talking in this code language and and we it seems like all of us had something silly that we did like that uh, making up something that others couldn't understand you know I'm, I'm so thankful that's not how god wrote the bible it's not some mystical language. It's not that you have to get into some deep meditation and, and some state of uh, transcendentalism to be able to get into this state where I'm, uh, I'm in some mystical state. Now, now I can understand. I've transcended. No, it's, it's just regular language. It just means what it says. And so you can read it and you can understand it. Now, with that said, remember that the Bible was written thousands of years ago. The, the, the most recent books, uh, they, they date, I think, around A.D. 90, which still puts it almost 2,000 years old, 1,970-some uh, years. The uh, uh, rest of it, some of it, 4,000, 5,000 years old. And so uh, it's, it's, it's from a long time ago, and it's from a place that we didn't live. It, it's, a different, it's a different part of the world. It's a whole different culture. It's a whole different time. I'm saying that to, to say it was regular language, but it was a different time and a different place. There, there's, there's some things that we have to understand if we're going to be able to understand it. Imagine if, if my wife back there, Viola, she wrote me a note <clears throat> and it said, uh, Brandon, go to Kroger, pick up a large bottle of Tide. Don't forget to use the coupon. 
We'd all understand that, right? Uh, now, it doesn't mean that it would happen, but we would understand it. Sometimes we get home and Viola goes, you didn't remember the coupon, did you? And I was like, I knew there was something. I got the tide. I got the bottle. I just, I knew there was some, one other thing. I always tell myself, I count, I count how many instructions there were. One, two, three. And in the store, I'm in there going, okay, one, two, three. And, and sometimes you just can't get the third one. And you don't want to admit that you couldn't remember the third one. So, but all of us today could understand it, right? We go to Kroger. I, I know which bottle she's talking about of tide. I go there. I get it. And I use the coupon, I come home, and I, I succeeded. It was a success, a successful trip to the Kroger. And so uh, we can all understand that. But imagine if that note somehow, and, and I know it wouldn't survive, but if it, if it did survive 2,000 years from now, and 2,000 years from now some people are doing some archaeological digs here in Mooresville, Martinsville, and, and they pick up that piece of paper that I dropped in the Kroger parking lot and blew over into that field and as they're digging up they, they find it and they read that now they could not immediately understand that because there's probably not Kroger at that point 2,000 years from now uh, there's probably not Tide they probably have some advanced way of cleaning clothes off into the future that they don't have to use washing machines anymore and, and they probably for sure wouldn't understand what a coupon was but you know what they could understand that they could read some historical things. They could, uh, they could hear about how there, were, there was a time when there were places where people went and bought things. Uh, they could understand that uh, even though that's not how they clean clothes now, back then that was how you clean clothes. There were machines that you poured liquid into and it cleaned the clothes. They could understand that. It wouldn't be easy necessarily to figure out. It would take some work maybe to understand those things, but it could be understood because it's regular language. Now, that helps us, that's a, a very simple illustration, but that helps us to understand what we're reading took place 2,000 years ago. It was not the same time, it was not the same place, they didn't live the same way, but we can learn some things about the way they did live, we can learn some things about history, and we can say, okay, I can understand, there were kings that lived. And there was a kingdom time, and, and when one, one king uh, died, his son would become the next king. And we can understand things about the Bible, and we can understand things about transportation and, and all of those different things. And so it could be understood. It would involve context. It would involve word meanings. It would involve some historical perspective. But you know what? No one that found that note, no one would be able to say that that note meant go to the car lot, buy a truck. Right? We can never take a message that says one thing and just apply our own meaning to it. No, as we read it and understand it, we say, okay, uh, that's, that was a place that things were bought. Uh, Tide was a, a, a type of detergent that cleaned clothes. And so we, they can understand the context, but we can't just take and put our meaning to a particular message. And so let me give you some Bible examples here. Uh, letter B, it may take work to understand. It may not make sense, but it could make sense. Uh, people often approach Scripture by putting their own meaning to a passage. Uh, probably, we, we know people like that, right? Uh, we know people maybe that you work with, and, and every time you bring up the Bible, uh, they've just kind of already got all their own opinions about what the Bible means. They've already figured out what a passage, well, this is what, this is what that says. And they put their meaning to a passage. Let's look at two of them. John chapter 14 and verse number 6. That's a familiar verse that we read a lot of times. <coughs> Talks about salvation. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, we're not going to get into a real deep study of that verse. Uh, but this verse could pose some questions. As you read that verse, if that's, if that's the only verse you read... Uh, one of our first questions would be, to whom was Jesus speaking? Right? It says, Jesus saith unto him. We, we wonder, who's him? Who, who's he talking to? Uh, uh, another question that we might have is, is, what was the question that was asked? A lot of times you make a statement, you're answering something that someone else said, or you're at least answering maybe a statement that they made. If it wasn't a question, it was at least a statement. So, so some context would be a thing that will help you in Bible study is when you read a passage, always go back and read what came before and always read what went after. And that will help you to be able to understand that all together so that you don't just read one thing and say, okay, 
uh, Jesus saith unto him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Here's what I think that verse means. No, we don't have to put our meaning into that verse. We read what came before, we read what comes after, and then we put it together to say this is what Jesus was saying. Uh, they might even uh, say, what's the way? What is the truth? What is the life? And, and it's good to, to look words up. Uh, a lot of times, if I'm really studying a passage, I'll look up every single word in the verse. Uh, maybe not a and 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 the, I know what they mean. Uh, but any other word, I, I want to kind of read the fullest definition of what that passage meant. Um, uh, Dr. Bernardi used to, uh, uh, Noel Webster's Dictionary, I drew a blank there for a second. Uh, Noel Webster's 1828 Dictionary, probably one of the best dictionaries closest to when the Bible was written. And so it's a, that's a good dictionary to use. When you read a, a modern dictionary, um, they're giving more modern definitions, and, and now we're almost 400 years removed from when, when the King James Bible was translated originally in 1611. And so uh, an, an older dictionary, an older, older definitions, but it helps you to understand. So you can understand what the way is, and what the truth is, and what the life is. But here's what you can't do. You can't walk away from that verse accurately and honestly and make this statement that as long as we're sincere, any road will get us to heaven. Right? That's not an accurate statement. That's not an honest statement in, in interpreting that verse of Scripture where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's, there's no honest way to walk away from that verse and make a statement to people that, well, you can get to heaven any way you want as long as you're sincere. No, you'd say that's a, that's a, a dishonest uh, translation or interpretation of that verse. Uh, that's a dishonest uh, uh, application of that verse. Now, let me give you another one. John chapter 10 and verses 28 and 29. <coughs> and in John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, again, Jesus is speaking. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now here would be uh, the, the subject being dealt with is not salvation. The subject being dealt with here is eternal security. Uh, the question, can you lose your salvation? A person that's saved, can they become unsaved? A person that's saved, uh, can they become lost? Can they lose their salvation? Well, according to this verse, if we read it and we do just some, some quick study about it, it's Jesus speaking. Jesus says he gives them eternal life. Well, eternal life is forever. He gives eternal life. He, said, he, he goes on to give even more explanation. They shall never perish. And then he gives more explanation. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And so uh, all of those statements, we couldn't, we couldn't come away from that and say, well, I think you could lose your salvation by fill in the blank. If we, if we said that, what we would be saying is we would be taking our, our beliefs and putting them in, uh, as the meaning for that verse. Because nowhere in that verse does the Bible say we can lose our salvation by any means. And so when we start talking about losing our salvation, it's somebody taking what they feel well, a person that did this horrible thing, even if they said they were saved, they must have lost it because there's no way a saved person could have ever done that. And then they take their beliefs and they, they impose that meaning onto a passage of Scripture. And that's inaccurate and it's dishonest. Uh, we have to come to the Bible and say, what does the Bible say? And what does the Bible mean? That gives us a, an honest and an accurate interpretation of Scripture. Uh, we cannot add to the Bible and give a reason that we think someone could lose their salvation. And, and this is simple, and it's not an exhaustive uh, 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 study this morning on salvation or on eternal security, but just a quick look at a couple of verses to say that the Bible, God's Word, is to be our final authority. When it comes to any question, what we always ought to go back to is not my opinion or your opinion or anybody else's opinion, and when we talk about opinions, Facebook is full of a lot of opinions, isn't it? I get people, I see people ask questions on Facebook. Everybody starts answering. Everybody starts giving opinions. Everybody starts giving their opinions. But you know what we really ought to be looking to? What does the Bible say? What does God's Word say? Because that is our final authority. When we have a question in life, 
when we're trying to come up with a stand or a belief in life, we want the Word of God to be our authority, to be our final authority. What does the Bible say? And so approach it with the attitude of understanding. Realize that God is revealing, not concealing. And then lastly, know that language can be unclear. That even though God uses clear language, language can be unclear. And by that I mean it may not immediately be understandable, but it can be understandable. And I've, I've said that a couple different ways in the message this morning because I'm wanting us to understand it, that when we read something here in the scriptures and we don't immediately understand it at, at surface reading, right? We read through it, I don't get what that means. Don't just close your Bible, but rather dig a little deeper and say, okay, I didn't understand that. Let me read the verses before that. Let me read the verses after that. Let me, let me look up a definition. Maybe there's some words in there that I don't understand. And so it may not immediately be understandable. I think that's kind of how we want everything in life. Just, uh, God, I read your word, and you just instantly give me all of this mystical, spiritual wisdom. No, that's not how it works. No, God gave us his book. God tells us to study his book, to make every effort. God tells us to be a workman, to dig into it, that it's going to take some time. It's going to take some effort. But I want to understand this, that many times it's going to take prayer. Uh, there have been several times that I've prayed and said, God, I don't understand this passage. Will you help me to understand this? God, I don't understand this subject. Will you, uh, your Holy Spirit, will he guide me into truth? Will you help me? We, we seek the author uh, to help us to understand a passage. The question is not, do you immediately understand the verse? The question is, can you understand the verse? And the answer to that question is yes, yes, you can. Uh, each of us have passages that we read and we don't immediately understand, but you can understand the Bible. Not only does God have the ability of language, but God has created man with the innate ability of language. God's created man that way. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20 uh, and, and I'll just read it, but notice what it says here. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he could call them. And whatsoever Adam called on every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found in help meat for him. Adam named every animal. That is amazing to me. Uh, and I know we don't have all the different breeds and all the things that we have today when they were created, but just think of, of all of the animals, and they come, and Adam gives them a name. I'm thinking in our family, we're not very good namers. Uh, I remember Job had a, a stuffed animal that was black and white, and he named it Blackie Whitey. <laughs> Can you imagine if Job would have been Adam? We'd have a lot of names, a lot of animals with some really dumb names. <laughs> And so I remember when Reagan was going to be born, maybe me and Job were a lot alike, because when Reagan was going to be born, Viola picked Reagan. She said, I could pick the middle name, and my, my choice was Megan. And she said we couldn't do Reagan, Megan. And so Reagan ended up with Gray. So we did pick my second choice. But I'm just thinking, if we had to come up with all the names, right? I mean, uh, moms and dads, they'll, they'll, they'll labor. Sometimes you have the name picked, but a lot of times all nine months, you're trying to think, what's the name going to be? What's the name going to be? Adam named all of them. I'm just saying God gave us this innate ability uh, to understand language. Think about this. Any child born anywhere in the world can learn any language. Isn't that amazing? A child's born, uh, and, and, and if they hear the language, they, they hear it, and, and they start making sounds, and they start saying words, and they can speak any language anywhere in the world. God made us that way. And, and, and they can pick up the language. Any Christian has the ability to understand biblical language. Amen. Now, this, this Bible, there are times that it's going to be hard to understand. I, I understand that. I, not only do I understand it, I've, I've experienced it. I can say that by personal experience. There are parts of it that are difficult to understand. But you can understand it. And, and that's my encouragement this morning. It's really, in, in many ways, this is an encouragement not just to read your Bible, but to study your Bible. Don't just read it, and at surface, at surface glance, I didn't get much out of it, and so, well, I just, I just can't understand that. No, you can. You can understand the Bible. Uh, several factors can make the Bible difficult to understand. Sometimes it's, it's foreign words or archaic words, and, and there's really not as many as we might think there are. Uh, I read one website that said of the 12,000 words in the King James Bible, and that's one of the big complaints about the King James Bible that we use here at our church, is that people say, well, it's, it's difficult to understand. It has so many archaic words. 
The truth is, out of the 12,000 words that are in the King James Bible, only about 300 of them are archaic words. 300 is not really that many. I, I'd encourage you, there's a website, uh, uh, Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. You could, <coughs> excuse me, you could uh, Google that, that website, C-A-R-M, and the word archaic, and it'll probably be the top thing in Google search. And they have a list of the most common archaic words. And there are, there are going to be some of those 300 words that you're going to have no idea what they mean. Many of them, uh, it may not be a word that you use all the time, but you say, okay, yeah, that's, that's what I thought that word probably meant. Uh, and so of the 300, many of them, you, you may not use them in everyday language. That what, that's what makes them archaic. But we have a word that's so similar to it that you say, well, that's, that's exactly what I thought that word meant. And, and there will be some of them that you'd have no idea, but, but that would be a, a good list to help you uh, uh, to go through and, and understand some of those archaic words. It takes just a little bit of work. It takes just a little bit of time to look up that word and say, I've never heard that word before. Well, you haven't heard it because it's archaic. We don't use it today. But you can look it up, and you can understand it, and you can know it. Then, of the common words that are used, of 12,000 words... All 12,000 of them may not be in your vocabulary, right? When the kids uh, uh, started out in elementary school and kindergarten, first grade, second grade, uh, their words, uh, they, they come home with spelling and vocab words, and they're, they're kind of words that everybody knows. Once they started getting up seventh, eighth grade, they still had some vocabulary words. There's some words that I'm not sure I'd ever heard before. And, and, and so we have to work at that, don't we? It's a, it's a word uh, that's, that's still used in English today, it may just not be a word that you use all the time. And so sometimes there's just general definitions of words that, and sometimes, uh, and I don't want to spend too long on this point, but sometimes even if you think you know what something means, it's good to look it up to know, okay, yes, that's what I thought that meant, but it helps kind of give you some confidence that, okay, that, that is what that word means. Or, or maybe you read just a little bit extra that helps you understand it even a little bit more. Uh, context or how the words are used in a sentence. Um, just yesterday in our car, this was a good example. Uh, Reagan, uh, she asked what something meant. I think it was the word defer. She goes, Dad, what does the word defer mean? Well, uh, I knew what the word defer means, but it helps if you hear it in context to say, well, well, how was it used in the sentence? And so that that helps us. So many times we don't understand something in the Bible because we're just focused on one verse. Okay, and, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be an encouragement here. I'm not picking because you don't understand something. I'm just saying kind of pull out a little bit, back up a little bit, and, and read the context. And a lot of times just going back and rereading it, really paying attention to what came before it and what came after it, you say, oh, okay, now I see it. And so context will really help you to understand uh, how the words are used in a sentence. Uh, a basic knowledge of grammatical rules will greatly help you in understanding the Bible. And if grammar is not your strong suit, um, it, it might take some more work. So I need to go back. And, but, but, you know, all of us can know what the parts of speech are. Probably one of the biggest things that will help you is to know what the subject is and what the verb is. Uh, who, who, who is doing it and what are they doing? And so you, you, you find the subject and you find the verb. And, and just some basic grammatical rules, right? You're not taking a, a test to get you into college and to see what class, what English class you can test out of, but just say, I, I want to understand the basic rules of grammar, grammar. And probably in that list, maybe nothing will help you understand the Bible more than just knowing those, just the, the basic rules. And then knowing and being familiar with idioms used in the Bible. The Bible uses idioms, idioms that would have been spoken in that day and they would have meant something to that people, but they don't mean something today. We, our English language is full of them. We use little idiomatic sayings that they mean something to us because we've heard them all of our life. Uh, raining cats and dogs. You've, you've heard that one. You said that somewhere else. Uh, they probably have no idea what you're talking about, right, in another country. But here, everybody knows what you're talking about. Well, the Bible is full of, of idioms. Uh, I remember National Geographic in um, 2011, uh, they did a, an entire issue on the 1611 King James Bible because of the popularity and the use. And, and they, they talked about how all of these sayings in the Bible are still being used 400 years later. 
they've just been accepted into our, our vocabulary and our language. So, so be familiar with those. Understand what those mean. If there's a phrase that's used, uh, it might be an entire phrase that you say, what did, that, what did that mean? Well, look that up, and it will help you to understand. And so just all of this to say this morning, you can be a student of the Word of God. Uh, study takes work, but we are to make every effort. Um, this will take effort. We're to be a workman. Uh, you'll, you'll not immediately and completely understand everything you read, but you can. Uh, God wants you to understand his word. God gave us his word that we might know it. That, that's the big takeaway this morning. God gave us his word that we might know it, that we would read it and that we would study it and that we could apply it to our lives. Uh, God wants you to understand uh, sometimes language can be unclear, but it doesn't have to remain, it doesn't have to remain unclear. Uh, purpose to read and study God's word each day. And then I'll finish by saying this, uh, be systematic. Be systematic. And by that I mean have a, a time, a place, and a plan. Have a time that you're going to read God's word. Uh, when, when you schedule something, it's a lot more likely to get done. Don't just say, well, I'm going to try to read my Bible tomorrow. Just say, I'm going to read my Bible first thing when I get up tomorrow morning at 6.30 or 7.30 or whatever time it is. I, that's when I'm going to read my Bible. Have a place that you're going to read it. Uh, if, if you put that much forethought into it, it's much more likely that it's going to get done tomorrow. I have a time, I have a place, and then have a plan. Don't just, don't just randomly open it up. But say, I have a plan. There's 90-day there's plans. Uh, there's read through a book of the Bible. There's read through the New Testament. Uh, there's read through the whole Bible in a year. There's all kinds of plans. But have a plan that you're going to follow. And when you do that, uh, the, the success of you accomplishing your goal, the success rate is going to go way up. And so be systematic that you have a time, a place, and a plan. All right, let's go ahead and stand this morning, if you would. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. And uh, I know these uh, messages.